Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Center for International Development's Friday Speaker Series. I'm Sarah Dionerine, and I am a student at Harvard College and a CID student ambassador. Um, I look forward to today's discussion on bringing development strategy back, new insights from China, South Korea, and Singapore. The format for today's session is a 20 to 25 minute presentation, followed by um, about 20 minutes for Q&A. Before we get started, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. Given that this is a hybrid event, we will be asking questions from both in-person and virtual audiences. I will be walking around uh, with a mic for in-person questions, and my fellow CID student ambassador, Mariam, um, will be asking questions from the virtual audience. Um, we are also recording today's session, but we will keep the camera on the speaker only, ensuring that only voices from the audience will be recorded. The video of this event will be available on the CID YouTube channel following the event. Our next Friday speaker series is next Friday on the, at 12 p.m. Um, we will be featuring uh, Severine Oster, uh, Otisere, um, <clears throat> author and professor um, and chair of political science at Barnard College, Columbia University, who will be speaking about the front lines of peace, an insider's guide to changing the world. We hope you'll join us. But without further ado, I would like to briefly introduce our speaker for today, Kareem Sarhan, um, a research fellow at the Center for International Development at Harvard University. He joined us in 2020. His research is, research is focused on how countries design and implement um, development strategies. He designed and lectured on public policy on the public, oh, sorry, he designed and lectured a number of uh, executive education programs on the public policy process for government officials and policy practitioners in Egypt and the Middle East. Prior to joining the CID um, and dedicating uh, and deciding to dedicate his time to development and uh, policy research, he is co-founder and partner at Sharkawi and Sarhan, one of the leading law firms in Egypt. He has around 20 years of experience as a business lawyer in Egypt and the Middle East, focusing on the nexus between law and development. Um, during his legal career, he advised uh, development financial institutions and Fortune 500 uh, companies on multi-billion dollar investments in the energy sector, infrastructure sector, and financial sector. His areas in practice include public-private partnerships, project finance, and mergers and acquisitions. He holds a master in public administration from Harvard University, um, postgraduate diploma in organizational leadership from the University of Oxford, and a master in bachelor of law from the university, um, from Cairo University. Thank you for being here, and Kareem, welcome. The mic working? Can you hear me right? Okay, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, it, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here with all of you uh, at Harvard. And also it's a pleasure to welcome all our colleagues uh, online on Zoom. Uh, so uh, let me start by making uh, two points. Uh, the first point is that development is a puzzle. There are many factors which can impact the development fate of any country. My talk today will be about development strategy. So in this sense, I'm focusing on one factor and trying to zoom in into this factor. I'm not claiming at all that this is the only factor which determine countries' development outcomes, but I have passion to study strategy. And the reason for that is that strategy is not a predetermined destiny as history or geography. Strategy is a human endeavor, human effort. It's about people and leaders at certain points of time and history thinking how to act to change the fate of their country. So this is why I'm interested in strategy in the first place. The second point I would like to make as a starting point is that the word strategy is one of these words which means different things to different people. So some use strategy to mean policy. Others use it to mean plans. Others use it to refer to something as important. Saying something is strategic, it means just it's important. So in my view, the word strategy started to lose its meaning. We don't know what exactly we mean when we say strategy. The origins of strategic thinking is in the military domain. So part of my research was to go back to the military literature and try to think what is strategy there and try to see whether this understanding of strategy there can help us to think about development. So based on that, uh, my talk today would be about two big questions. The first question is what is strategy? And please bear with me in this section because I will go a little bit into military affairs. But then it will make sense to you in the second section when I ask the question, what is grand strategy of development? 
So what strategy? Here I will use two frameworks that are very well known in the military affairs to explain the meaning of strategy. The first framework is called ends, ways, and means framework. The second framework is called the four levels of war framework. So what's ends, of, end, ends ways, and means? In this framework, strategy is a function of three elements, ends, ways, and means. The ends refer to the question, what is the political objective a country is trying to achieve? The means refers to the question, what are the power tools that the country has? Whether it's military power, economic power, cultural power, soft power, intelligence. The ways is the question of how would the country use its power tools, the means, to achieve the ends? So this is basically how in military we think about strategy. And let me illustrate here by an example to make things uh, not too abstract. This is a Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. In 1967, Israel defeated the Egyptian army and managed to occupy all the peninsula of Sinai. So the Egyptian army was stationed in the west of the Suez Canal. This water canal is called the Suez Canal. And the Israeli army was stationed here in Sinai. In 1973, the Egyptians launched a war in order to recapture Sinai. So based on the ends, ways, and means framework, what was the strategy of the Egyptian army in 1973 to capture Sinai? Let's think about that. So when we think about the ends from the Egyptian perspective, it's liberating Sinai. When we think about the means, the Egyptians focused on two means. One, military power, and the second is diplomacy. The third, and this is where strategy will play, and I want you to focus very much on the ways because this is really the essence of strategy. How will we do that? The Egyptians decided to use military power to cross the Suez Canal and control only 12 kilometers of Sinai while inflicting major losses on the Israeli army in order to create a new balance of power. The second part of the strategy, based on this new balance of power, used diplomacy to negotiate a settlement with Israel under which Israel will completely withdraw from Sinai. Why did the Egyptians choose only to go 12 kilometers in Sinai? The reason for that, the Egyptian air defense missiles, which were stationed in the west of the Suez Canal, their range was 12 kilometers. So this is the range where the Egyptian air defense missiles can be protecting the Egyptian troops from the Israeli Air Force attacks. So this was strategy. When you look at the about, when you look to this framework, there's no plan here yet, right? We don't know how we will do that. It's just a direction. It's thinking how we can utilize our means to achieve the ends, but there's no plan. Okay, so where is the plan? This will bring us to the second framework, which is the four levels framework. And this framework, Strategy is a function of four levels. First is the political objective. Again, what's the political objective pursued by a country? Second is the strategy. Same question, how will the country use all its resources, either military, diplomatic, economic, intelligence, or cultural, to achieve the political objective? The third level is what we call tactics. Tactics is about movement of armies and troops to achieve the military aspect of the strategy. Operations is about the management of particular military campaigns and specific military actions according to the tactics to achieve the military uh, strategy. Now, let's apply this to the 1973 war example. So again, objective is liberating Sinai. Strategy, we talked about it, control 12 kilometers of Sinai, and then create new balance of power and then negotiate. So what were the tactics? This is where the plan will come into place, okay? So the tactics, air campaign against important Israeli military targets in Sinai, followed by cannon fire to cover the special forces causing the Suez Canal and boats, who will create bridges to connect the two shores of the Suez Canal, and tanks and soldiers will cross the canal. What are the operations? Managing of each of the above campaigns described under the tactics. Now, there are two important features of strategy when we look at this framework. The first feature is the order of hierarchy. 
This framework is arranged based on the order of hierarchy. Political objectives come first. You need to be very clear and define what, what do you want to achieve. The second level is the question of strategy. Again, how will you use your resources to achieve the political objective? Tactics and operations are basically strategy in action. This is where the plan will come. In order to be successful in achieving your objective, you need to ensure that the operation and tactics are aligned and are done in accordance with the strategy. So based on that, based on this understanding of strategy, strategy in military affairs does not mean the detailed plans. The strategy is the direction that you will take to achieve your objective. The detailed plans in military affairs come in the tactics and operation. So I want you to keep at hold this idea of strategy in your mind, because now we'll try to see whether this will help us to think about development. So what's grand strategy of development? So let's try to construct together a framework in development based on what we just heard now uh, about the meaning of strategy. So in this section, I'll talk about the framework. Then I'll try to apply it to China, South Korea, and Singapore. I might be more detailed in China. I'll go quicker to South Korea and Singapore for the purpose of time. But then I will conclude with what does it mean. So let's go to the framework. So grand strategy of development has four levels. One is the economic objective. Usually in development, the economic objective is to achieve economic development and growth. However, depending on the context of the country, you might have, you might have other objectives. It could be, depending on the context, reducing inequality or making growth more inclusive. So you can define whatever objective you think is relevant to the current state of development of your country. The second level of the grand strategy of development is the development strategy. What direction will the country take to achieve the economic objective? How will the country use all its resources to create the conditions needed to achieve the economic objective? The third level is tactics. What movements need to be made by the political leadership and the economic bureaucracy to implement the strategy? Now, I use the term economic bureaucracy to refer to the main public agencies responsible for economic affairs. So what movements need to be made? Movements here refer to a movement from point A to point B, a change of the current status, a change to the status quo, changing the current position and taking new position. This is what I mean by movement, but I will apply this and it will be more clear when I go to the practical examples. The fourth level is the operations. What specific actions need to be taken by which actor to translate the strategy and the tactics into a reality on the ground? Now, this refers basically to the actions. What actions do you need to make the moves that are determined by the tactics? What actions do you need to change the status quo? What actions do you need in order to take a new position and change the current position? Now, looking at this framework, I would say also there are two main features we need to consider. One is the order of hierarchy. Economic objective comes first, then the strategy, then the tactics, then the operations. The second feature that we need to think about is that when you look at this table, there are so many things happening here. There are so many actors here. You have the political leadership, you have senior government bureaucrats, you have mid-level government bureaucrats, you have frontline officials. And the successful strategy will require that you ensure that all these levels are aligned together. Now, something very important to bear here in mind, strategy, is an intellectual activity. It's the thinking about the best way you can take to achieve your objective. Tactics and operations are strategy in action. In order to succeed in achieving your objective and your strategy, as we said before, you need to make sure that the tactics and operations are aligned with the strategy. Now, in this sense, military strategy has two obvious advantages over development strategy. The first is the tight command and control structure. This is the military at the end of the day. The second is the moral aspect that you are sacrificing for something bigger than yourself. You might die for your country in a war, but I hardly can think of anyone who will die to implement a development strategy, right? <laughs> 
So in development, strategists need to think about three critical questions in order to move from thought to action, from strategy to tactics and operation. These three critical questions, in my view, are how to build the state capability needed to implement the strategy. The second question is how to align the interests of the bureaucracy and other main actors with the strategy. And the third is does successful implementation of the strategy require influencing or changing some aspects of the culture of the society at large or the economic bureaucracy in particular? State capability, alignment of interests, cultural change. This is what strategists in development need to do in order to ensure that we move from strategy to action, tactics, and operations. Okay, so let's see how countries did it. Let's think about China. Let's try to use this framework to explain the experience of China in economic transformation. Now, in 1979, China had one of the lowest GDP per capita in the world. You can compare it at the time with Malawi and Chad. So they had really a serious poverty problem. So the question is, what kind of direction shall China take in order to get out of poverty? China believed, or the Chinese leadership in 1979, believed that status quo is impossible. They cannot just continue with communist policies. But at the same time, they don't want to be the United States. So they want to be something, not the Soviet Union and not the United States. So where, where to go from there, basically? This is a nice quote by Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese leader who was responsible for the open up. It's crossing the river by touching the stones. Basically, what he's saying is that we don't know what we need to do. So we'll try and experiment steps and try to move forward. And based on this experimentation, we will take certain direction. So what was the development strategy for China at the time? Experiment dual track economic policies. Hybrid system combining government intervention and market forces. Local governance to play a key role in development because this is a huge country and central government cannot do everything, so you need to delegate. Gradual open up depending on the results. So the idea here is that we will do both. We'll have government interventions and we have market forces coexisting together. And when the Chinese leadership would ask about what track are you taking, you don't seem to be like taking left wing policies or right wing policies. So what exactly is China doing? And this is another response from Deng Xiaoping. It doesn't matter whether it's a black or white cat, as long as it catches mice. This is, represents the essence of strategy, the focus on the objective and the understanding that means are subordinate to the objectives. Okay, so we have the direction. Seems like fancy. We will have government interventions and market forces, but where to move from there? I mean, what, what's next? Again, this is an intellectual activity, how to bring it to action. So the Chinese started taking some tactics and operations based on the framework I'm using. The first one was dual prices for agricultural products. What does this mean? The Chinese government, under the old system, the Chinese government used to buy all the crops from the farmers at a predetermined price. No individual incentives whatsoever. So what the government did is that it decided that it will buy only certain quantity at this predetermined government price, and any excess quantity would be sold at market price. So market forces plus government intervention. And do you know what happened? Huge increase in the crops production because you play to the individual incentives of the people there. So this is one, one of the tactics they did. The second tactic is decentralization and incentives to local governments. Now, as we said, China is a big country. And although the perception we have about China is that it's centralized, many literature is explaining that China is politically centralized, but economically and administratively decentralized. There are a lot of power given to local governments in, to pursue development. Now, so one of the tactics was decentralization and giving incentives to local government to be aligned with the strategy. Among these incentives is that they allowed local government to own investments, for-profit projects, was called at the time town villages enterprises. And the second incentive to local governments was 
allow them to retain part of the tax revenue so that they can use it to build infrastructure that is needed for development. Another tactic. A third tactic would be, okay, let's allow FDI and private investments in certain parts of the country. Another tactic, we want to align the financial interests of the bureaucracy with a new direction. So they created the salary system where lots of bureaucrats, their salary depends on a bonus, which is linked to the economic growth that will happen in their regions and counties. So it's a kind of a profit sharing, if you think about this from, from a private sector perspective. Now, all these tactics were implementation to the strategy, how to go through this dual track, through these tactics. And then there are operations. Set the prices for agricultural projects. I mean, talking, I'm talking about the actions now. I mean, what you will do. You will issue decrees permitting the sale of excess quantities of agricultural products at market prices. You will establish and manage the town and villages enterprises, which are the for-profit organizations owned by local government. You will establish and manage special economic zones for FDI. Local governments and frontline officials to experiment ideas to attract investments in their county. So there was lots of experimentation happening from local governments here. Uh, but this experimentation was all happening within, again, the boundaries of the development strategy set out by the political leadership. Implement new salary system for the government employees. The one I talked about where they have bonuses linked to economic growth. Okay. Let's go quickly to South Korea and then Singapore. I wouldn't go through them into details. So South Korea, again, the objective, achieving economic growth and development. So what is the direction that South Korea will take in order to do that? Export-led growth based on creating and supporting local private companies, national champions in specific sectors. This was the direction taken by South Korea, and I'll explain how it's different from Singapore. Tactics, one of the tactics is review companies' exports, grant cheap credit, and other government subsidies to companies based on their export level, what some people call the export discipline. And there were a number of tactics and operations done by the Koreans in order Again, they were all aligned with the development strategy, including protectionism measures, incentives to people working in certain sectors and so on. Singapore had a different strategy. Remember Singapore, I mean, it started its significant growth in the 1960s. At that time, the word foreign investments was a dirty word in the developing world because it was seen as like a continuation to the colonial pattern of exploiting developing countries by the superpowers. But here is how, how, how Singapore thought about it. A quote from Lee Kuan Yew. We had the real life problems to solve. Our duty was to create livelihood for 2 million Singaporeans. If multinational corporations could give our workers employment and teach them technical and engineering skills and management know-how, we should bring in the MNCs. Again, I, I don't care whether it's a black cat or white cat. So what's the strategy here of Singapore? Position the country as a regional hub for multinationals, export-led growth, but this time is based on attracting foreign investments, not creating local champions like the Chinese, like, sorry, the, the Koreans did. Tactics, many tactics. One of them is make Singapore a first world oasis in a third world region, using the words of, of Lee. This is in 1960s, right? So we do, and this entails strong rule of law, Measures to fight government corruption, make the city a remarkably clean city and apply tough penalties on the violation. Again, sets of tactics and operations. So if you think about it, the three countries actually has taken different directions. So the Chinese, their strategy was experiment dual track economic policies, hybrid system combining government intervention and market forces. South Koreans, export led growth based on creating and supporting local private companies, national champions. Singapore positioned the country as a regional hub for multinationals, export-led growth based on attracting foreign direct investors. The Koreans and Singaporeans are different and in some ways contradictory. Both led to significant economic growth. Lesson learned, it, there's no one way of doing it. Each country can do it its way. Okay, not only that, but I argue that the Chinese, after 10 years of economic transformation, had a new grand strategy. So the development strategy in the first decade of economic transformation was what we talked about, the will track policies. In the second decade of economic transformation, they done more firm direction towards market economy, 
modernize the administrative apparatus, exercise control over public funds, reduce corruption in government, and retain the role of local governments in development. And this development strategy has different tactics and operations. And I tried to show this in my paper, how, how it was different. So it's not only context specific for different countries, it's context specific depending on the development phase of each country. Strategy from thought to action. Am I on time? Who's keeping me? Uh, I wanna make sure I'm on time. I'm okay? Okay. <laughs> strategy from thought to action. Remember the three elements that are needed. State capability, alignment of interest, and cultural change. Now, to me, state capability basically in this scenario means the creation of competent economic bureaucracy that can implement the development strategy. It's the creation of strategy implementing institutions. Let's take the examples of South Korea and Singapore. In South Korea, it was the Economic Planning Board. In Singapore, it was the Economic Development Board. The names look similar, mandates are different. One is about creating national champions to make an export-led growth. The other was about attracting foreign investments. But there were some similarities when it comes to building the state capabilities. Both institutions were created as powerful organizations and they had formal authority over other institutions in the country. So the Economic Planning Board was described by many writers as a super ministry. It exercised control over so many aspects of economic policy. The second common feature is that these organizations were based on attracting top calibers in the country. They really got the best of the best from top universities, from scholarships abroad to be part of this. Secondly, they gave them autonomy and power to experiment the roles. So there was a level of bureaucratic autonomy. They were subject to less roles than the other um, government institutions. But this autonomy and experimentation was all happening within the boundaries of the development strategy of each country that I just described. It's not enough to build the state capability and to get the right people. Alignment of interest. You need to ensure that the interest of your economic bureaucracy is aligned with your development strategy. So the idea of alignment of interest is about incentives to the economic bureaucracy. So you're not just relying about their sense of mission or public purpose motivation. As one of the books talking about the Korean experience said, the officials at the Economic Planning Board were showered with incentives, financial incentives, career promotions. Actually, in Korea, the Economic Planning Board was the platform for producing ministers and deputy ministers. So imagine you're working in this agency, you're getting paid very well, and your career progression is to become a minister or deputy minister, plus the public service motivation you have. How, how will performance will be in these organizations? Uh, in the Economic, uh, in the economic uh, Development Board in Singapore, Singapore ensured that the salaries it's paid to government officials are compatible with the salaries paid in the private sector, basically. And they were benchmarking that all the time. So again, incentives to the economic bureaucracy. The third and final point is the cultural change. And let me take this example from uh, China. So the Chinese development strategy since 1979, when you think about it, is contradicting the conventional wisdom of a communist party. They're talking about individual incentives, they're talking about open up, they're talking about private sector. So the Chinese had to bring new beliefs to their society and to their bureaucracy. And these beliefs were reflected in the slogans used by the Chinese leadership, especially Deng Xiaoping. So some of the slogans he was using in his talks, for example. Poverty is not socialism. Let some people get rich first. Markets are good. Reform and opening, this is what we are doing. A new belief was created in China. To get rich is glorious. It's not a bad thing. And this is a slogan in one of the counties in China. See what it reads. Investors are gods. Prospectors of investors are heroes. Bureaucrats are humble servants. And those who harm corporate interests are sinners. This is, in my view, the real Chinese cultural revolution. So what's the grand strategy of development? I'm, I'm wrapping up now. It's the overall direction that a country takes to achieve economic development. It provides the big picture reference, guidance, and direction for the development policies and plans of the country. 
It consists of four elements, the objective, the development strategy, the tactics and operations. Alignment and consistency between the four elements are critical for a country's development outcomes and is context specific. Difference from a country to country and in the same country from a phase to another. And in order to move from strategy, from thought to action, you need the three things, state capability, alignment of interest, and cultural change. Now, what I'm trying to do here is to bring some concepts from strategy as a field to development as a field. I just want to say one word about the power that this can, can do. Edgar Shin, professor at MIT, is the professor credited with finding the subfield of organizational culture. Before Edgar Shin, we didn't know that something called organizational culture existed. What Edgar Shin did is that he brought concepts from sociology and anthropology to organization studies. And then we start thinking about organization in a different way. It's not just about systems, about structures, about procedures. There's something like organizational culture. A final example is from music. This is Abdel Halim Hafiz, one of the most famous Arab singers ever during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And let me show you how he transformed or contributed to transforming the Egyptian and Arabic music. Listen to this piece. Oh, something with the voice? Sorry, do you have an issue with the voice? Sorry, one second. This, this is a bit fun, so uh, before we close. <laughs> Mm, no, not working. Difficult. One more time. If not, I have no problem. Mm. Where? I think it's high. Okay, I think we will miss this point. Okay, so anyways, what, what I was trying to show here is that Abdel Halim brought the saxophone from the Western cultural tradition and bring it to the Egyptian music. And the, this piece is how the saxophone was adapted and used basically to produce Arabic and Eastern music. So my idea is that if you bring instruments from different disciplines, different culture to what you are doing, you can listen to new music, new ideas and new ways of thinking. Now, my final call is let's give strategy a space to be part of the development orchestra and you will hear some good music, new ideas, new ways of thinking. Thank you so much, I'm done.